Good evening. I am Michael Mainelli, and it is a delight to have been invited by Vinay Gupta and the team at Materium to address you today up in Glasgow at COP26. The title I've been given is Real Finance Beyond ESG, Beyond Environmental, Social, or Governance. And I've deliberately chosen this World War I advertisement on the right, Daddy, What Did You Do in the Great War?, to emphasize that all of us, I feel, are trying to figure out our place in the great climate change war. But I also hope that today you'll understand why I'm not a COP26. I believe that there are better things to do than to interview with the people trying to get their job done up there. However, we here in London run a think tank called Zien, and we have many ideas on what we feel could help enormously. I'm going to talk about two, one which many people talk about, a carbon tax or carbon price, and the second, government policy performance bonds. I'll come on to both of those, but they are based on a lot of research that we do here, in particular from our three indices, the Global Financial Centers Index, the Global Green Finance Index, and the Smart Centers Index. What I'd like to cover in the short time available is my thoughts on green so far, the various viewpoints and frames that we use, the roadmaps that will get us to net zero carbon in 2050, and what might FinTech do in these climate wars. The first thing, of course, to emphasize is that the city or the financial sector has actually taken climate change quite seriously for far longer than most people know. The very first Clean Air Act was in 1953 in the city of London, well before the National Clean Air Act. And we had a number of initiatives ranging from the London Accord, which was commissioned before the Stern Review, including support as well for the Stern Review, our various indices, and currently the Green Finance Institute. I had my first debate on climate change in 1984 here in the city of London, and that debate would end today. Where it ended then, does society really want to pay for it? And can we talk honestly about the numbers involved? So what we're focusing on here as a theme is that policies need pricing. And this slide, the top half of this slide, actually comes from 2007. Focus on the carbon market, set higher policy standards, avoid carbon dumping wars, and support more research, because some of these areas are not as well researched as people might have you believe. But on the bottom of this slide, I've said, listen to the music of COP26, or should I say the financial music, the Stern Review concluded that 1% to 2% of GDP was required. So too did the London Accord. And this translates today into approximately US $400 to $800 per UK citizen. Another way of looking at it is to take the just slightly under 10 tons emitted on average by each British citizen and multiply it by the current price of carbon, which is approximately $50. And you come to US $500 per year per capita or multiply it by a target, which is likely to come about if the carbon markets are extended from approximately 40% to 100% of something circa $100, in other words, $1,000 per year. And these are not the numbers that you hear. And until you hear realistic numbers, I think it's difficult to talk about climate change in the round. Not least because awareness isn't going to be sufficient. We had an enormous shutdown and change of behavior in developing countries around the world last year due to the pandemic and found, in fact, that emissions only dropped by 6% at, uh, at a small point. So we need to look, too, to what are finance people thinking? Well, they are thinking pricing, and that's very, very important in terms of carbon pricing. But the second thing that's bothering them is, in fact, the political and regulatory frameworks, which they don't trust. An argument here in the city has been if you wanted to be a successful investor, you probably got that way by betting against government policies on green, which often are capricious and change and cost those who follow the government uh, quite significantly when they are altered unseemingly or due to political interests. Another area that's not particularly strong on what I might call deep practitioners' minds is ESG, environmental, social, and governance. This idea has been that investment can be redirected well, it's had 25 years and more already. It's still, as MIT calls it, an aggregate confusion project 
with uh, companies such as Shell in the top 5% on one ESG algorithm and the bottom on another. There's an alphabet soup of these models and we're creating effectively a separate currency, as well as I might point out, driving a number of brown firms into private equity. And what we are seeing in gross aggregate is in fact that firms around the world, finance firms and industrial firms are still betting in ranges of approximately eight to one that fossil fuels will be around for some time. In other words, they don't believe in government policies. But we do need a roadmap to conclusion and you're probably very familiar with some of these technology roadmaps which look at where our emissions can work their way down to zero. And these are of course absolutely crucial, but they need to be supported in turn by roadmaps that are related to finance. So we happen to be big supporters of the sustainable development goals, but there are other roadmaps out there. Uh, this one on the left from Project Drawdown actually talks, and I think this is interesting, where the sixth top solution to climate change is actually educating girls. So we're going to see a multiplicity of ways to achieve our targets, and that's what markets are very good at. Trillions of decisions within, over, within an overall price framework with some competition can see enormous amounts of change in a way that awareness or behavior change can't. And so we need to move from the bottom two quadrants, regulation and ESG, and there's nothing wrong with either of those and they need to be maintained perhaps, but we also need to charge and that can be via taxation or via internalized costs. And frankly, auctioned permits uh, that are tradable are tantamount to a tax if in fact people are paying for them upfront. So I, I would argue we need economics, pandemics are insufficient. And when we look at these things of where, where are pandemics happening, it's really about trying to add to a lot of this top-down talk, the bottom-up mechanism of hard financial decisions made day to day. And to put those financial decisions into a much stronger framework, one of the things that was proposed both at COP in Copenhagen and at COP in Paris was the idea of government policy performance bonds. We've seen performance bonds emerging in the private sector since 2018, and a government equivalent would basically be that a government issues a bond that pays an interest rate that rises if it fails to meet its target. With the proliferation of 2050 net zero carbon targets, for example, a government might issue a bond of say 10 billion, and if in 2025 it hasn't decreased its emissions by 14%, which is exactly what the straight line projection is at 3.57% reduction a year, then the bond would pay the difference. So if it hasn't gone down by 14%, but it has gone down by 10, the bond would pay 4%. If it hasn't gone down by 14%, but it's gone down by five, then the bond would pay 9%. If it's actually gone down by 14% or more, the government effectively gets a free loan. And those people who felt that they didn't trust government policy had been able to hedge it appropriately and ensure convergence here between the private and the public sectors. Governments want us investors and private sector entrepreneurs to invest 25 to 30 years ahead well, it too needs to put some financial skin in the game or it is being hypocritical. So I would argue governments need these policy bond cuffs. They are known in the private sector as ESG link, sustainability linked, performance incentive. And you can see here at the bottom, a huge number of firms have issued these uh, just the last few years. And it may constitute something like a third of the bond, green bond market by value. So I think we're here talking here about recognition of the obvious. Carbon pricing matters. If we get different people to make different decisions every single day, the world would be a better place. And these better economic decisions need to include externality. In fact, carbon is no different than any other pollutant one should charge for its use and its emission. Might point out price really does matter. And the example I love to use is that in 2013, U.S. drivers drove 4% fewer miles per capita. And it wasn't because they'd finally got the message of the Sierra Club. It was because petrol prices rose by 32% that year. And these trillions of financial decisions will turn up in the systems that all of us love building in the fintech world. 
A good example was how DeepMind, using its machine learning and AI, reduced Google's data center cooling bill by 40%. And that was, frankly, millions and millions of little tiny decisions at every point along the way. And so this is where fintech really does have a strong role to play in the climate wars. There are big opportunities out there for AI, machine learning, dynamic anomaly and pattern recognition and finance in areas like the carbon markets, energy storage markets, transport markets, really combining economy efficiency, effectiveness and innovation with reductions in time, eliminating some of the problems to do with different locations, combining functions and reducing consumption. So we can save the planet one bit at a time, but market measures are essential, not desirable. It is not about awareness. We need competition, open data, better regulation, and voluntary standards markets, of course, a well-rounded market. And FinTech should be lobbying both for cost of carbon, but also for policy performance bonds to ensure that there really are financial handcuffs on government policy as well. And the implication for me and for fintech should be a shift from the idea that we're labeling saving products as green or transactions as green, but we're really moving to a much stronger focus on trading and the internet of things markets, moving from putting uh, little lipstick type applications on the pigs of banks to creating mini echo Bloombergs for the masses so that all of us have got the tools and the power to make those trillions of decisions much better. So I would conclude by saying thank you very much to the team at Materium for allowing me to share some of my thoughts with you today. I hope that you're enjoying COP. I hope that you are thinking hard about how it works, but when you return home, do remember that markets are going to be the way that we will solve climate change and that we need as people in finance to work extremely hard at convincing government that it too needs to put some skin in the game financially. Thank you.